Good morning, friends. Whoops. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I am really happy to have you here with me today. We are heading down to the barn to milk with our new milking machine. We went down and tried it for the first time yesterday morning, so I thought I would bring you with me today and show you how it works. I absolutely love it. Good morning, honey. We grass feed exclusively with our cows. So I have some extra special hay here that honey loves that I use in the stanchion for her instead of grain. And it also encourages her as soon as she sees it, once I get in there, she will follow me right in. <laughs> like I said, she really likes it. Go on, go on, let's go, let's go. Good girl. Good girl, sweet girl. Good girl. This cow has been such a dream because she was easy to trans, uh, transfer over to hand milking and then to transfer back to machine milking because that's all she's ever known has been a breeze. She did get a little afraid with the sound of the machine yesterday when we first turned it on, but it only took her a couple of minutes to adjust to it. I could not be more grateful. So one of the plans that we're gonna be working towards before winter comes is this little spot that we're in right now is the only spot with a concrete floor is actually to frame this room in for a, as a milking parlor and put water and a hot water tank in here. That would be the dream because then I could do all the cleaning. We could have it all drywalled so it was really clean so I could hang all my, um, or wash and hang all of my milking stuff right here and not have to haul it back and forth to the house. That would be amazing. <laughs> Make it a lot easier for sure. Needs to bring quite as much water. I don't feel like that was very graceful, <laughs> that whole process. I don't have a rhythm for it yet, and it just felt kind of awkward. Um, and also a lot of work for a gallon of milk. But once we get this back pen, which I've talked about in the last few videos, getting that cleaned out, Dan's just been waiting for it to thaw, and it's thawed out well enough now that he can get out. And he's actually doing that this afternoon. And um, then we'll be able to bring milkweed off the field and put her, she's our other milk cow, and put her up there. Separate Patty, who is milkweed's calf that she took on when I lost, um, this is a long story, <laughs> when I lost Fireweed, who was my milk cow, um, after she gave birth to Patty, we bought these two milk cows and Fireweed, our uh, milkweed adopted Patty. So anyways, we're gonna be bringing Patty fire or milkweed, oh my word. So we're gonna bring Patty milkweed and put honey in the back of the barn, separate Patty at night and then milk both cows. And then it will be definitely worth all this work. Plus once I have a system for getting this all cleaned and getting it up to the house, as you can see, our barn is way down there and our house is way up here. So there's quite a jaunt in between. I might actually set up one of the quads with a trailer on it too, although this is a pretty good workout. But anyways, I know I'll streamline this process as we go. So we're just gonna go inside now. I'm gonna make a batch of cork, talk a little bit more about that because there was a lot of questions about it. Show you what finished cork looks like because I have a finished batch. These are the scrubbers that came with my milking machine. So this is for inside of the actual this part here, and I'm not sure what this is called, the suction part. And then these ones are for going down the actual tube. So I've just given these a really good wash. So now what we're gonna do is make 
some cork. I am using buttermilk starter. This is actually my preferred way of making cork. It makes a really creamy, sweet cork. So what cork is, from what I understand, is a German cheese. I think that's where it originated. And the way I would describe the flavor is that it tastes a little bit like a yogurt slash cream cheese. After it's had a chance to ripen, you hang it for up to six hours. You can even hang it longer and that will determine how thick it gets. And I like it quite thick. I'll show you in a second, the finished batch. So I've just added my culture in here and this is my fresh raw milk that's at the perfect temperature for, because it's nice and warm for this culture. So I'm just gonna let this rehydrate for five minutes, then I'm going to stir it, then I'm going to add in a little bit of rennet. Originally, cork, and I think the way that it's done still in lots of places, you don't add rennet to it, but I do add a little bit because like I said, I like it nice and thick. So now I'm just gonna stir in. So now I have my rennet, I'm just dissolving it in some water, and then I'm gonna add that in here and I'll let this sit for 24 hours. So this is what cork looks like. So you can see it's like a super thick yogurt with a flavor that is quite reminiscent of cream cheese. It is so delicious. So the kids made pancakes while I was outside. So I'm gonna have my pancake with a little bit of cork on top with some maple syrup and some berries. This is that berry mix that I got at Costco that I was talking about that I love using with the cork, it is so delicious with a little bit of maple syrup. We almost always make our pancakes in cookie sheets like this so much faster. That is so decadent, absolutely scrumptious. So I decided to shake things up a little bit with this video. So this is actually the next morning. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to show you the cork on its next stage. So can you see how it's kind of pulled away from the sides like that? And it has lots of whey on the top and it looks like yogurt. So like I explained, I think that was yesterday. <laughs> it might've been another video. This tastes very similar to a cream cheese kind of yogurt combination. It's a little bit more sweet than yogurt, less sour, at least I find. And I did use a buttermilk starter in this, so that could be why. And then what we're gonna make with this is a German cheesecake. So I didn't know this until today when I was doing some research on making cheesecake with this, that um, German cheesecake is actually made with cork. So we are going to make one and cheesecake is one of my very favorite things so you can see all that whey pouring off there i'm going to save a little bit of the whey to use as a starter for my next batch and then you can see how thick that is so we're gonna dump that out oh it smells so good into a strainer with a cloth a nice clean cloth and i was asked when i was talking about contamination in my cork and my cheese and all of that in a previous video, I was talking about yeast contamination and several of you asked how to tell if it's contaminated with yeast. It is very easy to tell. So yeasts in the air act very similarly to any kind of yeast that you're going to add to bread. So you know how it forms the holes in it and it expands. The exact same thing happens with the cheese. So it's going to form little holes. When my batch of cork was contaminated, the lid actually lifted off and it leaked all out. I knew right away by looking at it and then it also will smell a little bit yeasty as well. So I am going to take this and I'm going to hang this for six hours or so, give or take till it's the consistency that I want. But since I am going for a thicker cream or a thicker cork to make the cheesecake, 
I might hang it for a little bit longer and then lift it up like so and you can see all of the um, the way draining out of there. Okay, I'm just gonna get these dishes put away over here and then I'm gonna hang my cork off of the handle of my cupboard. That's the way I do it. One of my sons is going to build me something like a little stand for hanging so that I can have it sitting on the counter instead of on the cupboard door. But that's what I have to work with for now. Okay, cork is now hanging over there and that will drip. And now we are going to make a new dish for dinner tonight. And this is out of a recipe from 1933. You can see that the person wrote it right across the top there. And this is, it's called Bot Boy, B-O-I. It might sound exotic, but it's really the name of a good sturdy dish of Pennsylvania Dutch origin, submitting a, submitted as this week's $5 prize winner by Mrs. Jack Ruffer, 1280 Oakmont Road, apartment 54G, Leisure World, Seal Beach, California. And the recipe is as follows, Pennsylvania Dutch pot pie, bot boy. And then she wrote on here, good. So hopefully it's good. <laughs> but this is a, the oddest pot pie. So we need two pounds of stewing beef or veal, six potatoes, one onion and salt and pepper. So that's the only ingredients for the inside of the pot pie. And then the crust is a typical crust with flour, shortening egg, a little milk and water and salt. But this is the weird part about it. So we cut the meat, we fry the meat up, we boil it for one and a half hours, but I already have some canned, pressure canned stew beef here. So we don't need to do the boiling part. And then for the dough, we cut the shortening into the flour, make the dough, yada, yada roll it out thin and then cut it into squares. It doesn't say the size of squares, but based on the rest of the instructions, I think they must be, you know, like inch by inch or two inch by two inch. Um, then into the boiling meat and liquid, slowly drop layers of sliced potatoes, sliced onion and dough squares. So over here, I have sliced up some potato and some onion. And then, there should be enough liquid to boil over the top of the crust. Cover tightly and cook for 20 minutes. A pinch of saffron may be added. Talk about a simple recipe. I am going to add some vegetables and also because I only had one can of uh, beef, I have also fried up a pound of ground beef and I fried this up in some of my lard. So I'm gonna turn that on. I also have some broth here that I'm going to add as well as the juice out of the beef here. So we'll get that going. I am going to add a few mixed vegetables in there as well, because why not add some extra veggies when you can. So I'm just gonna throw in some mixed veggies. These are some of the ones I got from Costco, probably whoops <laughs> oh dear ah. just around a cup or so also going to add a good pinch of salt come to a boil and then we will make our pastry dough over here so we need one and a half cups of flour and it looks like I just have that much in here and I have this handy dandy one and a half cup measure these are those um, cups that I got from Costco I don't know, a month ago now or so. These are fabulous. If you guys get a chance to buy a set of these from Costco next time you're there, if they have them, definitely do because they are super sturdy. And this whole one and a half cup measure is fabulous. Three tablespoons of shortening it calls for. I am going to use some of my lard here. I 
can't wait to make that cheesecake. It's gonna be so yummy. I have started on another project that I am excited to share with you. And I waited until I knew it was going to be close <laughs> before I decided to mention it because the cookbooks I mentioned back when I first started the project and it's taken a long time to get them actually off the ground. We are very close on that, that one too. But one of what I wanted to share with you about today was a membership community that we are starting over on my website. I've been asked a lot about doing a Patreon and I have had Patreon before, but I decided to do my own off of my own website and I am so excited about it. I've been working away on creating really awesome content there. There's going to be live Zooms with me. There's going to be lots of different guides on different subjects. My whole idea or the whole idea behind doing it was a way to be able to interact more directly with you because as my channel has grown, which is wonderful, of course, it's been harder to have a direct connection with my subscribers. And this is going to be a way to have a little bit more of an intimate um, area, platform, community. <laughs> and that's my goal is eventually to have it really evolve into a, a vibrant community. But it is also a place where I can house a lot of my how-to content that doesn't necessarily fit here on YouTube anymore because I have moved more into a vlog style channel. So I am super excited about it. We're hoping to have it launch for May 1st. And if you sign up for my newsletter, and I have a link right down below this video for that, you will get notified as soon as it goes live. I'll share with that here on, uh, or about that here on YouTube as well. But the newsletter is a really great way to get direct um, information for me when I launch different things that I'm gonna be doing. All right, we have our almost dough here. Okay, there we go. A little bit more dough-like. <laughs> Dan's sneaking by the camera, trying to not distract me, except being more distracting because <laughs> I'm being so silly. That's okay. So now we are going to roll out our dough here and sadly I really am completely out of flour and I'm going to need some flour on this so give me two secs I'm just going to go and get a little bit more flour okay a little bit of flour on our counter and our dough it says to roll it out thin and it says to layer the onions and potatoes with this. So I'm not sure if that means to put the layer of onions, then the layer of potatoes, then the layer of pasta, I kind of feel like, or not pasta, um, crust. I kind of feel like that's probably what it means. So that is what I am going to do. Like I said, it doesn't say the size of squares to do here. So I'm just kind of winging it and doing what I think looks probably the best. Okay, there we go. So we have our potatoes, our onions, and our crust. So I am going to layer my onions in first because that's just kind of what makes sense to me. And then my potatoes. Do you know what I love about using all these old recipes is they use ingredients that I use all the time and that I have from here on our farm. So I don't usually have to go buy anything from the store 
to make them. So it's said to do six potatoes, so obviously more than one layer. So definitely have to add a little bit more broth since it's supposed to be over top of the topping. We'll go with that much. Okay, <laughs> there it is. So now we put a lid on and we set our timer for 20 minutes. I feel like this is gonna take longer than 20 minutes, but we'll start with 20 and go from there. So I'm just going to tidy up our mess right now, and then I'm going to make the crust for our uh, cheesecake. So this cheesecake actually uh, is generally made without a crust, but I am, why did I put that there? I am definitely a crust person. So I am going to make a graham crust for it and get that all ready, even though it's going to be hours before I can actually make the cheesecake. I'll just get it all done now so that I can have my kitchen work finished for today. All right, let's take this out of here and see what we have going on. Somebody over on Instagram, because I was sharing about this over there, was saying that this was more like a dumpling type of thing, which it really is. Oh, okay, it's starting to, so there we go. You're actually going to have this for lunch today. I was gonna do it for supper, but why not have it now since it's lunchtime? It smells good. So I'm just gonna let this cool down for a little bit because it is very hot. We'll give it 15 minutes to cool down and try. It doesn't look terrible. Okay, let's try this. This is definitely different. It's like a more like a soup than a pie. Oh, that's hot. So I think that if I do this again, I would cook the meat the onions on top and then the potatoes and I would boil that and cook that and let the gravy reduce a little bit and then I would put the uh, pastry part on the top of it and then bake it so that it was kind of brown and crispy on the top instead of more it's more like a um, like a dumpling kind of flavor it tastes good but it's um, definitely not like like what I would consider to be a pot pie so we're gonna take a pause, have some lunch, and I'll come back with you a little bit later on and we will put this German cheesecake together. I can hardly wait for that. All right, our cork is ready. It's been hanging here for close to six hours. It is 4.15 right now. So we are going to take it out of our cloth. I'll bring you down close so you can see how thick it is. So you can hang it for even longer than this if you want it to be even thicker. But I always give it a really good mix because sometimes some of the parts on the outside that get drained a little bit more end up kind of like a little bit chunky. It looks like, like a really thick yogurt. I have already cooked my crust for about 15 minutes at 350. Okay, we need five eggs separated. So all of this whey is going to go out to the pigs today. Okay, so this calls for two pounds of pork. I'm gonna call that two pounds because it's what I have. So we'll grab our eggs. One, two, three, four, and five. 
three quarters cup of sugar. Teaspoon of vanilla. Quarter cup of cream. Tablespoon of lemon juice and two tablespoons of flour. We're going to incorporate all of this together. Look at how beautiful that looks. So now we need to whisk up our eggs until they are nice firm peaks and then we'll fold that into our cheese mixture. Okay, so we're just folding in our egg whites. And now we will bake this at 350 for just about an hour. Okay, our cheesecake is now chilled. I can never remember how to get these off. Aha, uh -huh. that's how we do it. It looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty good. That is delicious. Mm, mm, mm. This is a totally different kind of cheesecake. It's more spongy, a little bit more eggy, but absolutely delicious. I'm really, really happy with the way that turned out. And this, it looks like something that you could feed company. And it's a good thing because my son, my daughter-in-law, and my grandson are actually here. So I'm going to cut them up a piece and sit down and have a visit. I hope that you guys all have a fabulous day and I'll see you again next time. Bye.